Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to Telecast. We recorded so many great discussions in Cannes last week that they wouldn't all fit into one show. And my guests this week have all got important things to say, so I didn't want to cram them all into last week's show. So on this week's Telecast, I catch up again with Film UA's Katerina Vishnevska. She described what's been going on in her life since we spoke a month ago, when she was in Kiev. And I have a rooftop chat with Gregoire Polad, Director General at ACT, the Association of Commercial Television and Video on Demand Services in Europe. He was in town to receive an award for the work his organisation has done in combating disinformation. And apologies in advance for the sound quality in this interview. It was a little blustery, and it's certainly right for trying to enjoy a bit of sunshine on the top of the palo. But please stick with it, as it's a really interesting discussion. Both interviews are coming right up on this week's Telecast. So we talked on last week's show about how great it is to bump into people physically again in Cannes. And I've just bumped into a previous guest on telecast i'm sure regular listeners will remember when we spoke to katarina vishnevska from film ua when she was in kiev quite a moving conversation that we had i think katarina welcome to telecast again how are you doing thank you it's good to be back and uh, uh i am doing better than the last time uh, we spoke or rather the from the past weeks of my life uh, there were a lot of ups and downs but uh, I can confidently say that today I am feeling better than uh, I have had in uh, in quite a while and uh, it's been a long journey so far from Kiev through Odessa, then across Moldova, and then Romania. So it was a long journey to my uh, uh, home in London, and uh, it made me also really aware of how lucky and privileged I am to have that, uh, because uh, I followed the journey of thousands and actually millions by now of people uh, along the routes uh, from Ukraine to Europe with the key difference of me having where to go and they have having nowhere to go and that's the experience that um, I don't think I will ever be able to forget it and I don't want to either because uh, it is important to keep it in your heart and uh, uh, my family is safe now as well uh, oh, well that's, that's fantastic yeah. news because when you were on the show I think it's about four or five weeks ago now you were obviously incredibly worried about your mum, weren't you, who's in uh, Mariupol. Tell us about any any news you've had on that front. A lot of news, uh, thank God. And uh, yes, so far I am from Mariupol originally and uh, uh, the big failure of my life in a way is the fact that I didn't get my mum out of Mariupol in time, even though that was the plan when I uh, um, arrived to Kiev from London, she stayed, and uh, then it was 17 days of uh, continuous, constant bombing of uh, my town of birth, my childhood home, and of me not knowing whether my mom is alive. Uh, um, she is. We managed to get her out and uh, across Berdyansk, which is controlled by the Russians and uh, Zaporizhia to Lviv. So she's now there, safe and resting and uh, coming to terms with what happened. And it is, uh, it is the saddest thing I've experienced in my life uh, to actually be talking to her now because the depth of her pain and the horror of this things she had to live through it's unimaginable and uh, uh, so how did she get out then was it one of the um, Red Cross convoys that we've been we've been hearing about uh, all sorts of ceasefires allowing Red Cross and other organizations to go in and evacuate people was it was it with 
a Red within Cross one of those evacuations. Never in Mariupol. A Red Cross was actually if uh, they withdrew. So I don't know. There is a lot of publicity out there, and uh, I don't think I'm qualified to talk about that. But uh, from the experience of someone who has family and friends in Mariupol, and uh, luckily. Almost everyone I know managed to get out safely, not everyone, some people are still there, but um, so from the experience of the people I know, Red Cross was actually never there. They tried to deliver some goods in the beginning of the war, but then they basically just withdrew their operation from that part. Of, uh, but the local volunteers, they worked, and this is how my mom got out. And it's, it's a lot of factors, actually, because basically volunteers were trying to get in and evacuate people out of Mariupol all through the war but it is physically impossible in the areas where uh, it's the active uh, fighting zone and that was my mom's uh, uh, district it was also from so the streets in which um, my apartment building stands it was this devising divisive line between uh, the uh, russian controlled and ukrainian controlled uh, parts. So basically, they kept fighting for that. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, it's now under the Ukrainian control, which means that uh, their fighting ceased, or at least it's not as active anymore. And so that and allowed, the, allowed the volunteers, her to be able to get out and the volunteers yeah, could access. Yeah, the volunteers them. came in and they walked them on foot. So they left uh, Mariupol on foot and then eventually they were picked up by an evacuation bus with no windows with bullet holes, etc. <sighs> Along the way, they met uh, for, uh, because you have to you have you have to pass a whole bunch of uh, checkpoints, and uh, uh, it's the Russian-controlled area of, uh, between Mariupol and uh, from towards Zaporizhia, so like Berdyansk is on the way. One of the stories that uh, she, my mom told me, and that's gonna really stick with me a long time, is that uh, so you uh, have to show your ID to all the Russian soldiers on the way. And one of the guys, uh, one of the Russian soldiers, told uh, to the woman who was sitting uh, in the bus uh, next to my mom and also had kids with her, he told her uh, that she should take better care of her children because it looks like they're cold. And it is one of the most screwed up things if I've ever heard in my life, the parental advice from people who destroyed everything those people had it's uh yeah. yeah yeah well i mean i'm sure there's you know there's going to be you know thousands of individual stories of uh of that experience that your mum's lived through as well because it, it, it it's you know impossible for us to comprehend and here we are sat you know, in the French Riviera in Cannes, which is sort of you know so at odds with what's happening in uh, in Ukraine. It's it, it's a little bit strange to think about it too much. But so your mum is coming back to London, is that right? Well, she's never been before, so she's only coming to London for the first time. But yes, that's right. Uh, uh, she got her visa. She got her UK family visa in one day, which is absolutely amazing and I'm so lucky that I actually have, uh, I mean I had to produce the hell out of it uh, for, to try and uh, fast track the process. Uh, so I emailed, texted, switched, Facebook, Instagram, uh, I'm probably forgetting some other social media. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I reached out to my MP and uh, she personally handled the case. So uh, uh, my mom's visa was sorted uh, within the day. It's Cedric Tulip and she's amazing. This is not a paid advertising. <laughs> it's just the reality is that uh, there are also some good stories to be told. Uh, yeah, yeah. About, yeah. Well, this it's a story with a happy ending, which is yeah. which is yeah. fantastic to, to hear. And we all need we all need happy endings. I think you know stories with happy endings at the moment. Switching to TV because this is where we are at MIT TV. There seems to have been a few. TV industry organizations partnering up together in Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what, what they're looking to achieve? So um, the whole industry is realizing that uh, it must survive. It's the best way to um, support the people of the industry, their families. Um, 
and ultimately Ukraine. So we started to, you know, change starts with you. So we are trying to uh, rebuild uh, from what's within our reach. And it's the first time in my history of, uh, in the industry where everyone in Ukrainian content industry is coming together like that because we were basically like a dysfunctional family at times arguing about things uh, what's the right things to move forward etc but this is the time when like the whole of country if uh, our content industry is standing together so we are here with uh, uh, with the stands which um, also has a name of stand with Ukraine and uh, from its film UA but also three media groups, one plus one media, Starlight Media Group and Channel Ukraine, who basically combined their resources, their people, efforts, etc., to jointly find a way um, forward for the industry. And we had a panel dedicated to that uh, as part of the conference program. And we're taking a lot of meetings, trying to find ways of um, actionable solutions. That's, uh, that's, that, that's the plan. And uh, we do have an action plan and the industry is listening and uh, the feedback is positive and there is a both human and political will to um, help us and I think there is a strong realization of that uh, by helping us we're actually helping all of us not just uh, the Ukrainian industry and that's uh, it's marvelous. What's been uh, the uh, industry's reaction to people you know on the stand because you you must be meeting and seeing people from all around the world here. T uh, TV industries from, from you know, many, many countries are here. What, what's been their reaction to, to the Ukrainian stand and your, your discussions? It was very popular. Um, yeah. Oh, my God. So many people stopped by. And, of course, we had a lot of meetings uh, pre-scheduled. And... People are very willing to f listen, and everyone is already doing something anyway, which is also fantastic. It's just that uh, there's this also awareness that if we tell them what's the best way, it's like on a personal level, people reach out to me and ask what's the best way to help. It's the same thing. When there's this willingness to help, if we tell them how to best direct it, it's uh, a win-win for everyone. So. Basically, the industry is saying that, yes, we want to do it. Tell us what you need us to do. And uh, this is what we're doing. We're trying to tell them what to do. And to, to be fair, because um, living in the state of war means that there's so many things you have to deal with and you're just uh, also at a loss emotionally. From, so from, um, we have um, a lot of ideas, but we haven't formalized many of them. So we're going home now and working on that. But uh, uh, we now know that when we do formalize it uh, and go back to all the people we met here in Khan, there will be ears to listen to what we have to say and uh, work on the plan together. And just finally then, just um, remind us how the global TV industry can help Ukrainian content businesses. If I were to put it in one sentence, it's, uh, it's basically the best way to help our industries actually for to help us keep the industry. So we must continue producing content. It's Yes, it is at some point going to be about the stories that we have to... Uh, once we process the trauma and survive the war, these are the stories that have to be told and have to be heard. But to be able to do that, the industry must survive first. But before we get there, keeping our industry and uh, continuing producing content is a way to f help the people within this industry. It's our industry is the people. It's their families who are dependent on them being able to work. It's the auxiliary industry. If, um, and then everyone can go and buy potatoes from the local farmers, etc. So it is a trickle-down economy. If we start producing contents, we 
help so much more than just uh, the content creators. But to be able to do that, we need money. And there is no money in the industry in Ukraine at the moment. So what we're trying to do is to set up um, a global acquisition fund. And we're asking everyone to join. Uh, if you're a channel, if you're a platform, but also if you're a distributor or an association, individual producer, production company, please contribute to the funds and the money that will be pulled in that funds will go to fund content across the whole Ukrainian industry. So it's not for Film UA specifically or one of the uh, groups we're partnering with. It is for the wider industry and it is going to be a charity fund set, uh, set up outside of Ukraine, independently managed by a board that we are putting together. So the idea is to have a cross-section of the industry represented in that board. So a uh, commercial channel, a public broadcaster, a global streamer, uh, a distribution company, a festival, uh, a media company, etc. So uh, in that sense, it will be like a proper charity fund so that it is, uh, for, you know, accountability, transparency and all of that. And the money that you put in and every little helps will go to fund uh, uh, content creation across uh, different genres. So we'll do um, factual and animation as the most easy things to do straight away, but also scripted drama. And then thinking ahead, the beauty of the idea is that... Uh, once that content is produced, we would invite the companies, well, it's of course it's of interest uh, first and foremost for channels and the platforms, but we would invite them to actually broadcast that content that they helped fund anyway. So hopefully, ultimately, this will also create this bigger integration of uh, uh, Ukraine into the global economy and just make us all better connected as human beings on all levels. It sounds like there's been a lot of work done on it and uh, uh, we'll include a link to uh, to that uh, initiative in the episode description. Katerina, thank you again. It was so lovely to, uh, to hear your mum's story and it's so lovely to see you in person after uh, our original conversation when you were in Kiev and I remember you saying, you know, I'm not sure what time we'll be able to do this interview because... We may have to abandon it in case of the air raid, you know, yeah. one which really sort of struck home to me. But it's lovely to see you safe and sound, and uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to seeing your mum in London very soon. Indeed, and thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to coming back to report of the success of our acquisition funds. <laughs> All right, good luck. <laughs> thank you. So we found a quiet, sunny spot on the top of the Palais de Festival, which is very pleasant, away from the hustle and bustle of the market floor. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Grégoire Paulade, who's the Director General of ACT, who's just won the MIP Sustainable Development Goals Award uh, in association with the United Nations at MIP TV 2022. Grégoire? Welcome to Telecast. Hey, thank you for having me, Justin. It's a pleasure. Tell us about ACT and your organization's goals. Sure. Uh, so ACT, uh, which stands for uh, the, it's quite a, quite a mouthful, Association of Commercial Television and Video on Demand Services in Europe, is, as the name indicates, the association that represents uh, television and VOD in Europe. Uh, we've been around since 1989. The original founders were ITV, Rosieben, Mediaset, uh, which was called Fininvest at the time, and TF1, uh, and has since then grown to 28 members. So uh, basically our members uh, are the largest players in the market. Uh, they're active in all European member states, the UK, of course, uh, EEA, and, and worldwide. Uh, so what does ACT do? Uh, well, ACT... Uh, for, for lack of a better description, is a lean, mean lobbying machine. Uh, we are there to make sure that the interests of commercial broadcasters are uh, basically heard. Because as, uh, as, as you may know, legislation, a uh, large part of legislation in Europe is drawn up in Brussels. Uh, and uh, legislation pertaining to IP, uh, 
uh, copyright um, pertaining to data, pertaining to audiovisual media law, uh, and pertaining to data is uh, centered in, in Brussels. So we uh, at ACT uh, have two main goals, which is A, to understand what's going on in Brussels for our members, and B, to try and change course or alter course or propose courses for the legislator to move forward so that we can ensure that our members can reinvest in content to the benefit of millions of Europeans. So the, the award that you just won was uh, RX Global's uh, new award, which is uh, to in association with the United Nations, and it's basically been for your work on disinformation. You're part of the development goals media compact which is essentially the media aspect of the United Nations key sustainability goals and of which there are I think 13 or the 17 there's 17 okay so that can go that's everything from equality uh, climate change anything that comes under the umbrella of sustainability your award, which you've just uh, brought out very, uh, uh, very I'm proudly proud in front it's of me, <laughs> um, is um, essentially for your work on sustainable development goals for disinformation. Your members are commercial broadcasters. They are. How can commercial broadcasters then address the key challenges that society faces and our planet faces as well? Yeah. First of all, they've been doing it for a while, right? Because if you look at uh, TV, I mean, the, the, the basic goal of TV is informing and raising awareness, uh, but it also creates realities in a way, right? It's thought-provoking, it, it uh, creates conversation, uh, it leads people to look at the world around them and question uh, whether, you know, uh, we're going on the right way or not. Uh, so for us, uh, you know, it was a no-brainer, first of all, to join uh, the SDG Media Compact, uh, but also for, for commercial media generally, uh, despite the fact that we are commercial, of course, and we have commercial interests, we also have an interest in our viewers and making sure that, you know, they are informed and they have the right facts to make the right decisions. Really, for us, a good opportunity to contribute to uh, this global effort uh, to look at the problems that the planet faces and to be able to communicate on them in a way that allows people to make their mind up uh, with plural views, because that's what it's about, you know, whether it's commercial or public, uh, it's the yin and the yang. We have uh, media pluralism, cultural diversity, and we are, as commercial broadcasters and VOD providers, a substantial part of that equation. So we're seeing at the moment, uh, you know, the efforts that Russia and other states around the world are making when it comes to disinformation. And we're seeing you know, some terrible, terrible images um, that are coming out of uh, Ukraine. Of course, that's just the latest in a long line of, uh, of, of, of such disinformation, not just from that country, but from others as well. Now, we're also seeing that state broadcasters, they've got really great resources at their disposal dedicated to fact-checking. Commercial broadcasters, can they have the same sort of resources in place and, uh, and how can they maintain and build their own disinformation resources first of all if you look at the the picture of the number of channels right if we're looking just pure broadcasting in europe about 85 percent of channels in europe or 90 percent of channels are commercial right so uh, even though you know uh, for for one large public broadcaster there will be significant resources uh, you'll have behind that 10 20 30 40 general information broadcaster, pro commercial broadcasters that are there to provide news. So I think, you know, the resources kind of become equivalent after a while. And, and it's, not a, um, it's not a competition, right? We're, we're all there to be able to bring resources, to bring diverse stories to the viewers, etc., and diverse angles with regard to it. And it's not an alternative fact issue. It's just a simple different perspectives on what the news is with one fundamental principle, which is that, of course, you check your facts and uh, you have editorial independence. I think that's, that's the key thing that kind of unites uh, all news providers around the world. And that's the real distinction, if you want, between uh, news coming out of you know, regulated players such as ourselves or PSBs and you know, information coming out of completely um, random uh, sources. So for us, clearly, you know, we're putting the means into it because it's what our viewers expect. I mean, if you have a 
general interest channel, you will want your viewers will want to see news or will want to have news, even though it's not frankly a profit driving activity. Uh, but they will be we will they'll be looking for that. So for us fundamentally the, the key issue is how do we get the revenues to reinvest in, in that news? And that's where all the other work on copyright, piracy, etc., making sure that you know we can continue to basically generate revenues to pay for other other areas which are just not as you know revenue generating. But we know that, and and we're fine with that because at the end of the day, you know, we also accept that we do have kind of a a, a sort of public service mission in that in that way that we are there uh, to inform people properly, especially when we see all the rubbish that's online. And uh, it's not uncommon these days that, you know, at least two to three times a week in the news program, you'll have a full segment about, you know, fact checking for stories that came out online. And that's a rather good thing. Uh, but I, I think broadcasters, whether, whether commercial or not, would rather not spend that revenue having to do that. So our main goal is to try to make sure that, you know, whether it's uh, uh, the Facebooks or Googles of this world uh, have to essentially abide by equivalent rules than broadcasters uh, so that we don't have to spend that kind of uh, that kind of investment and money on that and we can yeah, do other stories. You talked about regulation and regulation is key here isn't it because essentially regulation engenders trust yep. when it comes to broadcasters and broadcasters have to adhere by a pretty strict set of uh, rules and regulations that some of the uh, huge uh, uh, social media death stars that, uh, to use a, a quote from uh, Evan Shapiro, a, a regular guest on the telecast, um, you know, that they don't have to, uh, have to necessarily sit under. Um, and, and we've seen the way that disinformation can spread online and that, you know, like wildfire and the way that certain governments and movements as well, we're talking about, you know, uh, during COVID, we're talking about referendums, whether it be Brexit, whether it be American elections, whether it be UK elections, whether it be elections in whatever country, we can see the way that certain governments and movements are spreading disinformation in order to muddy those waters and, and, and break down trust, essentially, in these uh, yeah. uh, a lot of these established broadcasts. So how does your work, you know, tackle disinformation then? We're not the be-all and end-all, right? So our, our members do the news. They have the journalists. They do the fact-checking, right? Which is not what the ACT does. Our, our goal, if you want, is to look at where we see gaps or lack of play, level playing field uh, with regard to rules. Um, and governments, many governments have always tried to disinform. That's not new. Uh, many private outfits have always tried to disinform at some stage. That's not news. Uh, what is new is the fact that we now have very powerful uh, companies, trillion dollar companies, Death Stars if you call them, um, that uh, basically benefit from this and who have been profiting for years now from basically a hall pass in terms of regulation. Because whether we like it or not, they are, in a, in a way, competing for the same eyeballs. They are taking attention from people. It is the attention-seeking economy that we're looking at. They basically win from an asymmetric system where I, whereby, you know, media such as ourselves, we have investment obligations, we have a huge rule book in terms of what we need to do, and these guys have practically nothing. Uh, and, and the issue there is that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we won't be able, I think, in the long term to be able to carry out all of these obligations if the level playing field isn't there. And that's what we've been calling for for many years. Uh, because right now, if, if you look at the rules, basically, we, we the, you know, the, the commercial broadcasters, PSBs, we look at, you know, a huge, you know, pages and pages and pages of rules, uh, whereas, you know, uh, social networks, uh, video sharing platforms, many of them don't. And, uh, and that's an issue. And it's also an issue from the point of view of the viewer, because the viewer doesn't know when he's in a regulated environment or an unregulated environment because you can't tell the difference. Uh, the, you know, the world of screens we're in now makes, means that he hops from one to the other. Mm. And uh, you know, that can be very confusing. And so our, our fight, if you want, in this is to make sure that at the end of the day, 
the viewer is protected no matter how he chooses to accept, access some form of content. Uh, and we want to be able to, you know, make sure that that is enshrined in, 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 in some forms of regulation, if not one, several. Uh, because it's once you break the trust, right, which is, I think we're almost there, actually. Once you've completely broken the trust in institutions, in news models, etc., then you start having people who live in completely separate universes. And it's quite dangerous there. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's actually, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about my son he's like 16 years old he doesn't really watch linear tv anymore so the so the information that he's consuming we we talk about this quite a lot is pretty much completely unregulated and that youth audience that gen z audience is coming through now in 10 years time that does does present a problem doesn't it you know where facebook or instagram or tiktok whatever wherever they're getting their entertainment they're getting unregulated information, essentially, and they don't watch TV. So, you know, what their worldview is going to be in 10 years' time is, is pretty disturbing, really, if you think about it. Not to be too, you know, not to be too de- depressing on a beautiful sunny day like this, <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it, it is slightly worrying, isn't it? Yes, they don't watch, probably, I mean, I can't talk for your son, but uh, I'd say so generally, you know... I, Many people tell me that people don't watch TV. I say, well, actually, you do. You just don't know that you do. Uh, Because, you know, obviously, TV has mutated, developed. uh, The content is is spread across different mediums. He's not watching live news, He's not watching linear, yes. Or he's not watching live news. Uh, But, you know... um, and then that is that is problematic indeed because it doesn't adhere to certain of the standards that we're used to, and uh, it does create, of course, like we we talk about the echo chambers, we talk about people basically being stuck in their own realities, uh, parallel realities. Yes, it's very disturbing, and of course, it leads to stuff like you know, sixth of January, the Capitol, and and all the rest that we've seen. And I guess that's why there's such an onus and push globally to deal with the issue. Because, uh, I mean, I don't know what it's going to take. Between the issues we had uh, with Brexit, between the issues we had with the capital, and the issues we had with COVID, where literally people were setting masks on fire because they thought it was spreading through (laughs) through 5G masks. It's very worrying. And uh, there's a point where you can, of course, talk media literacy and you can have fact checkers doing their job, etc., but that's never going to be enough until you have the regulators stepping in and saying, look, uh, sorry, social media. Sorry, you're actually going to have to invest. And, not, and that's not going to happen through AI, just AI, right? It means actually getting moderators. And maybe not moderators that are in the Philippines getting paid, you know, three pence an hour and, and, and basically committing suicide because they have to watch such atrocious things. Mm. Uh, but it is going to take a huge investment. And I think that's what, uh, you know, ourselves and, and, and regulators are calling for, which is, you know, at, at the end of the day, if you're a, a media company, which in a way these companies are, uh, you know, there's three things that, you know, are certain in life, death, taxes and regulation. And what's interesting, going back to the to Evan Shapiro's Death Star analogy, I mean, when you see those diagrams that uh, his map of the media universe that uh, he constantly updates mm-hmm. as he as is a media cartographer, um, they're great, you, by the way. Yeah, yeah they are fantastic. fantastic. But it really brings it home the size, and we'd say the reason why we talk using the term Death Star is that when you see them are laid out physically, you say the size of I don't know. A baseball, Google may be the size of base of, of a baseball, whereas you know, ITV might be the size of a, a pinhead almost in in comparison. So you realise then the resources that they've got at their disposal, and you're absolutely right. There should be some form of regulation. I mean, can you see it happening anytime soon? I think compared on the size point, uh, it goes back to sc- scale and market growth. Uh, because if you look at the story in Europe, uh, we've regularly, and this is like a never-ending saga of we need to grow, we need to gain scale so we can invest, so we can, uh, so we can create bigger media companies, so we can actually go in there and reinvest in news and make sure that 
you know, we don't end up getting gobbled up uh, basically by, by, by these companies. Uh, so there is a competition aspect to that, right? There's a, an issue around, well, okay, so how, how are we gonna, how are we gonna allow, you know, European companies to, to grow, uh, so they can, they can continue to matter? Um, I, honestly, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball or a Death Star at home. Uh, but, um, I, I would say that, um, when it comes to subjects that are so fundamental, uh, about you know which which touched the heart of our democracies, which touched the heart of our you know of our health, and I mean a lot of people you know are treating we are talking about this information are treating this information like they treat the big tobacco problem right it was it, at the end of the day it's the same issue it's this, the it's a huge public health issue it's a it's and having that means coming up with severe regulatory remedies uh, towards these platforms. And until that happens, I don't think we're going to be able to seriously deal with it because we've gone past the point of the market is going to correct itself. Clearly not. Clearly not. So now, you know, uh, and it's clear that now there's a willingness, you know, we've seen in Europe there's a Digital Services Act, there's a Digital Markets Act, completely different things, but that, that are being voted or have been voted or agreed upon. The same is happening in the U.S., not far, not far away. So there's a willingness. There's a political understanding that it's happened. Will it be enough? Not sure. Uh, but it's a step in the right direction. Well, Gregoire, it's been fascinating uh, listening to you. And congratulations on the award Thank again. You. And uh, good luck with all the good work that you're doing. And uh, maybe we'll see you again at, at uh, a MIPCOM or another industry market very soon. Thank you so much, Justin. It was a pleasure being on. Thank you. Well, that's about it for this week's show. There's only a few days left to grab tickets for the Telecast Content Funding Festival in London, taking place on April 26th. Just head to telecast.com forward slash events to buy tickets. They're starting at just 199 for producers and 299 for finances. And for a limited time, Telecast listeners can get an extra £20 off the ticket price by entering Telecast Plus. That's Telecast in capital letters and the plus symbol at checkout. We hope to see you there. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in CAP. Until next week, as always, stay safe.